there's so many different ways we can protest. And for me, it's a silent protest for me just to let people know that this isn't going away. We're not going in away. Like this is going to be here. You think I'm going to stop doing this, but I'm going to keep doing this every single day. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 221 of the Running Field podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. I am glad you are here. I hope you appreciated that episode last Friday with Oren J. So far, I know I needed it and I've needed his advice, his wisdom and just his calming presence over this last few weeks. So if you did miss that one and you need someone to just bring you back to calm, bring you back to feeling a sense of hope and that you can stand up for yourself while also uh, being able to approach yourself and and others with kindness and compassion, that one is going to be for you. Now, today I am excited to introduce you to Daryl Murphy, who I am thankful that Aaron and Joshua Potts recommended me to, to have him on the show. And he has been doing this amazing streak uh, of running and getting in exercise in a way that he hasn't ever before uh, because he wants to bring attention, do this silent protest uh, for Black Lives Matter, for some of the people like Breonna Taylor who have lost their lives because of uh, white supremacy. I think he has this just energy to him that we could all learn from and he really wants to, to do his part to just make a change in our world. And I admire him for that. We're going to go into his history uh, of running and how he was in college as a runner, but then stopped for for reasons you're going to hear. And then he just has a great story. So I'm really looking forward to you getting to know Daryl. And uh, I will put links in the show notes to go follow him in the future. And I really think you should go follow him. And and by the time this comes out, uh, I hope that he has got his next um, challenge up so you can go support him in that and donate to his cause because it's just really important. So before we get to the episode with Daryl, I just want to take a moment to thank Momentus and then we'll be right to the episode. This episode is sponsored by Momentus. I've been telling you about their collagen for weeks. I am really appreciating it for the ability it has given me to recover quicker, to have my joints and ligaments to be supported by their collagen supplements. I put it in a smoothie, you can put it in your coffee. It is totally unflavored. It is just really enjoyable to add to your diet without having to worry about what you are adding in there. It has 50 milligrams of vitamin C per serving and, uh, That is another great thing we can be adding to our diet during the winter months. Now, today I want to tell you about Elite Sleep. So when you're going to get your collagen from uh, livemomentous.com, and by the way, I should add that I had been telling you the wrong coupon code. I apologize to Momentous. Actually, I told you the right code, but I actually told you the wrong amount. This is going to get you 20% off. Code Tina will get you 20% off your first order. I was saying it was only 15, so I'm sorry about that. And, uh, It's actually 20% off your order if you use code TINA. Now, I want to tell you about Elite Sleep today because many of us need it. It is definitely a stressful time. My sleep has certainly been disrupted and uh, I have been able to use these Elite Sleep uh, tablets when I am struggling and I, I don't have any side effects. This is this unique research back formula created to help athletes fall asleep easier and achieve higher quality sleep. That's going to improve your recovery. That's going to improve your performance. A momentous sleep can benefit any individual looking to improve their performance by improving their sleep. The formula is a combination of three ingredients, which is melatonin, magtine, which is magnesium L3 and 8. Not sure I know what that is, but it, I know what magnesium is and wild jujube seed extract, which is going to help reduce the nighttime anxiety, help you gently fall asleep and improve your circadian rhythm to achieve a higher quality sleep. It is NSF certified for sport and informed sport certified. 
Elite sleep can be taken every night and it's not meant to fix problems with your sleep, but it's rather going to help you consistently improve your sleep quality for those people who rely on sleep for physical and mental recovery, which is all of us in general, but especially right now with what is going on, this is such a good thing and you can get your collagen, you can get your elite sleep and I'm looking forward to telling you a bit more about the creatine in a few weeks. But for now, go check out that elite sleep. If you are struggling with sleep right now, this is a really healthy, safe way to do it. And I want you to use code Tina to get 20% off your order. That's Tina at livemomentous.com. Use code Tina at livemomentous.com. Daryl, thank you so much for joining me today on the Running For Real podcast. I am excited to have you on here. Thank you. Oh, thank you for having me, Tina. I'm glad we're finally able to catch up and do this. Been looking forward to it for a long time. I know. We... This is, I mean, a lot of it has been on my part, but you and I have maybe had like four or five attempts to try and get this to work. Right. So I'm glad right. that I'm actually now sitting in technically across from you, although, you know, right. virtually. Right. Uh, to actually get this is the normal, done. though, it you is. know, it's a, it's a virtual. <laughs> it is. It's definitely, definitely a, a strange thing, but I feel like we're getting more and more comfortable with it, which is at least something. Um, and I want to just give a shout out to Aaron and Joshua Potts for recommending you and telling me immediately, as soon as I first spoke to them the first time ever, uh, they told me about you and said, you gotta, you gotta follow. They said stretch Murphy, which is what we'll go talk about in a minute, which you go by, um, online. Um, and I looked you up and I thought, yep, definitely, definitely want to bring you on sometime soon. And now we're doing it. So starting with that, you go by stretch Murphy on all your Right. social media and all your channels. Why Stretch Murphy? Um, Stretch Murphy, it just kind of came to me really through yoga. Um, mm. Since I've been in LA for a while, I've been doing yoga and I just got into stretching. That's kind of a requirement, and, isn't it? Living yeah, in that area. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, you know, when, when you're out here, it just gets to you and you just fall into it. <laughs> <laughs> you fall in line with the, yeah. the uh, LA crowd. Yeah. Right. Right. So, but when I was running back in school, I never liked stretching like before, after runs, like I was really against stretching. Like I just didn't see the usefulness of it, you know, just kind of being young and foolish. But then like coming out here, I just kind of really started enjoy to enjoy stretching. So I just started going by stretch Murphy and it just fit both the running and the yoga. Yeah. And, and for someone listening who not going to name any names myself, is also terrible at stretching <laughs> before and after <laughs> runs, even though I should know better. Uh, what would what what would you say to someone listening who, having been someone who used to be a non-stretcher to someone who does mm-hmm. stretch now, can you see a difference or can you feel a difference, I should say? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I can definitely feel a difference. Like just even doing like more dynamic stretching, like drills or something with hurdles or anything to kind of open up the hips or just doing like swinging the leg, doing circles like that, you know, all of that stuff really helps. And it's just a way of stretching without like static stretching, like doing a forward fold to touch your toes. So now I try to do it all, like whatever I can, like I still need to be better at it, Mm. like kind of doing more dynamic things because I see how much it does help. But just start small, you know, start somewhere and start doing some type of stretching and it'll definitely help. You'll see improvements for Mm. me, at least I have for sure. What what would you say are the improvements you feel? Um, Just I'm looser. Like it's it's amazing now. Like I've been running like every day and I haven't had like any injuries or anything like that. Like my body's just feeling better. I'm able to recover better. Mm. And really just most importantly, I'm staying injury free and I'm staying healthy through all the runs. And I think that's really just because of stretching every day. Okay, and we're going to go into why it is so important for you not to get uh, injured in just a few minutes. Uh, You mentioned I think you mentioned a few minutes ago about when you were, yeah, you said about running in college. Uh, So you went to a higher state university, competed for them. Uh, Tell us about how did that come about? Did you show promise right away? Tell us about your early days of running. Um, Yeah, running in high school for me was kind of like, uh, I really enjoy running in high school. Um, I guess I got into running um, kind of when I was in like eighth grade, uh, just getting into running track, but not running cross country. 
And then I got into running cross country when I was in high school, um, my freshman year, but then I kind of got hurt my freshman year and then started running like distance my sophomore year and running track. So I primarily ran like the 800 and the mile, um, in there. And I ended up going to Ohio state for college, um, uh, after my senior year of high school, um, I did pretty good my senior year. I just ran the mile at state and ran like 413 in the mile um, and got like fourth. And then like some colleges started reaching out to me and kind of recruiting me at that point. But it was just kind of really late in the year for me, you know, just because it was like June at that point and like college was starting in the fall. So it was really overwhelming for me for like so many schools to kind of be reaching out to me and recruiting me at that point and me having to make a decision. Had you planned to go to college at that point? Like did you already kind of have a plan in mind or was it unclear? Yeah. Um, it was like when I was speaking with my high school coach, you know, he would kind of always be telling me like, just wait, you know, until the summer and then we'll kind of decide like where you're going to go to college and what's going to happen with that. But then like on like my family side, my mom's like, well, you need to decide like where you're going to go to college. So it was just like, two opposite things, you know, coming to me, I'm getting this information from both sides. So like, I didn't know which one to really go with. So then I was planning to just go to Ohio state to college, like before that, before a lot of colleges started reaching out to me. And then I ended up just sticking with that choice and choosing to go to Ohio state for college. And are you from the Ohio area? Are you from yep. Ohio? I should say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So born and raised in Ohio, uh, Northern Ohio, initially Sandusky, Ohio, uh, which is famous for Cedar Point. Um, a lot of people go there for that. But then for high school, I moved down to Columbus and went to Reynoldsburg High School, which is a suburb in Columbus on the east side. OK. And, and where is Ohio State? I'm sorry, I don't know. Oh, Ohio State is in Columbus, okay. so it's like, you know, it's not far from okay. like where I went to high school at at all. Okay, so you were able to stay close to home, that's nice. And and yep. what was your degree in? Um, I got my degree in strategic communication from mm. Ohio State. Cool. Well, that kind of, that explains a lot. Now, now I, yeah. now I hear that and see what you do. So <laughs> kind of cool. So tell us yeah. about your college running experience overall. Now, I want to just preface this with for listeners who might not have thought about it before and are just starting to open their eyes up to this racism that's interwoven into every part of our society. Did you feel like it affected you in school? And did you experience these microaggressions that, you know, people might, people listening might be just starting to learn what they are? Absolutely. You know, looking back, I can see it in a big way mm -hmm. at the time. I didn't know that's what it was because that was kind of all I was used to. Um, so I wasn't seeing it, but it definitely played a big role in my career at Ohio state. Mm -hmm. Uh, so going there to run, like I only ran there my freshman and sophomore year at Ohio state. And then actually my junior year, I transferred to Kent state. Um, which is in like Northeastern Ohio, like Akron, Kent area. Mm -hmm. um, but then I ended up transferring back to Ohio State just to finish my degree, uh, but not running anymore. So that was how like my college running career came to an end. And it just really started off at Ohio State uh, being on the on the team where the coach there at the time, like he was a different type of guy, you know, my high school coach kind of warned me about him and like kind of told me not to go there. He was really against me going there, but, um, I just wanted to go there really because it was Ohio state and I had kind of planned to go there, but me being on the team, like he did not help the energy on the team at all, um, around that issue. At the time, I had like longer hair. I had dreadlocks when I went to Ohio State when I was running there. And the coach would always make remarks like, 
I'm going to make you cut those, you know, if you're not doing this and that, you know, just depending what it was at the time. And, you know, I, I never cut my hair at the time. I didn't, I didn't listen to him on that, but it was just like, he would make those kind of remarks repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And it was just kind of what it was like, you know, who was I to say something to him? You know, Mm -hmm. it was almost like a privilege for me to be on the team at that point. So it was like, I, I'm not in a place to speak up and, create change in this place, you know, when he's running the show. Was that a conscious choice at that time? Or was this kind of, uh, is that what this period of talking, the, all the, you know, conversations that are going on right now is making you reflect back on life um, and, and think about these things or were you aware of it then? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the current times have definitely made me reflect back on it, just getting back into the running community mm. and seeing the reasons why I left the running community initially. Um, just feelings of not feeling like belonging, you know, being on the team as well. Like I was the only black person that was on the cross country team. Mm. Um, we had, uh, primarily I would run like the 800 and, 1600, 1500 mile and track. Um, and there were a couple other guys that did that, but they weren't, or one other guy really in particular, but they weren't running with the cross country team. So even when we were running with the cross country team, like the camaraderie among the team members, I always felt kind of left out because in high school I was used to a very mixed team. Like we had multiple black runners. We had Hispanic runners on our, on the high school team. So it was a mixed crowd and it felt like real to me because we were all friends. And then coming into the collegiate environment, it was like, I didn't get, you know, that inspiration from my coach that I got in high school. You know, I had a lot of inspiration from my high school coach. He was really good. We had a good, you know, partnership. And then my college coach, I didn't get any of that. And then with the team members, just like having no diversity among the team members, Mm -hmm. you know, and many of the guys on the team were good. They, They were like a lot of good guys on the team. And we hung out a lot of times, but it was just when we were hanging out, like me just being the only black person, a lot of times it just felt awkward to me Mm -hmm. and it didn't feel like, like right to me a -hmm. lot of times. And because of that, you know, I would want to hang out in other environments at different times. And then you sometimes start to feel less and less a part of the team. And that's just like over time, it just started to weigh on me a lot. Oh, of course it would. Yeah. I, I'm not surprised to hear that. And I'd imagine that's a similar situation to to many people in the collegiate experience who are in your situation reflecting back on things. And OK, so, you know, what you said right there, um, having someone whose husband is a collegiate coach and uh, I mean, my husband has been trying to to make changes within his own world for many years and uh, the school he coaches at is next to literally two minutes from Ferguson, Missouri. So it's definitely a, 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 a not a sensitive topic for him, but um, something he's passionate about making a change. But I asked Aaron and Joshua this as well. Like, how do we how do we change this within the collegiate system? Because surely if we change the high school and college system in the way that black runners are treated, I mean, that affects everything on up uh, within the running world. Uh, so what do you think can be done? Yeah, that, that that's a great question. And I don't feel like there's one right answer for that question. Like it's definitely different in every situation. Mm-hmm. But overall, I would just say there needs to be more diversity, like on the coaching staffs mm-hmm. um, in, in these colleges. And like when I started getting recruited by colleges, I probably had one like black coaching staff that came to recruit me. Um, but I wasn't even really conscious of that at the time, like coming, like being in high school and coming, being on the cusp of coming into a college environment, you know, to think that having a black coaching staff would make like a world of difference for me Mm -hmm. in the running community. So I would also say, even for college coaches, like 
you know, that maybe your husband is in contact with, like, even for them to raise these kind of concerns with, you know, their high school teams, because that's kind of where it's really starting, Mm -hmm. then that's going to get the conversation going where even if it is the elephant in the room, people can call it out and they can say something about it. Yeah. Because I understand there, there's not a huge population of black runners that are like high school across country runners or junior high school across country runners, like people really growing up doing that. But even if people are able to see that it is a problem and start to talk about it, it can still really help to fix what people see as a problem right yeah. now mm-hmm. in the running community. Yeah, thank you. Great, great advice there. And uh, related to to that, um, I when I read uh, "How to Be an Anti Racist" by um, Ibram X. Kendi, uh, he talked about um, feeling the need to be exceptional or to be excellent, to to be accepted in most situations. That uh, he or he and and just black people in general have to go above and beyond to not be stereotyped. Can you, have you experienced that yourself? And and did you feel that in the collegiate setting in any way? Yeah. Yeah. I would definitely say that's been the case. Like just in the school system in general, I would think like just from elementary school to high school, to college, you know, to being in the corporate workplace, you know, you kind of always get a sense of that. But like, I definitely felt it, you know, in the running community, like when I came in in high school and in college, because there weren't many black people in distance running, Mm -hmm. you know, that were like American born black people in distance running. Mm -hmm. So it would always be like, you would be noticed, you know, like, what are you doing out there, whether you were good or bad? So you would always just try to excel at that. So like, it was different for me, like just really being able to accept it, you know, just because I had a lot of just like personal demons, I would say with distance running, you Mm -hmm. know, just being in college myself, just because it's really hard, you know, like anytime you're, you're, doing workouts and your training, like, you know, like it's, it's really can be demoralizing where you just feel like you want to kind of nap and sleep a lot of the times. <laughs> and then, you know, just continuing to do the, the, you know, the coursework and then not being able to like kind of confide in my teammates with all yeah. of this stuff that's going on, you know, that was probably one of the, the harder things for me. So you feel like if you can't be the best at it and you can't be excellent at it, like why continue to even do that? And that's kind of where I got to. So I just tried to focus on one thing that I did feel like I could be excellent at and I could be the best at, if not both, you know, just kind of choose one. So just being in that situation, I I did feel like that. And I guess that's kind of why I made a a lot of the decisions that I made at the time. Mm hmm. And of course that would, that would weigh on, weigh on you heavily and it's not surprising. And, uh, for any listeners who may not have experienced this, the U S college system is, is so intense. I mean, uh, you came out of school saying I'm done with running. I'm never running again. And that's not actually, a very, <laughs> that's not uncommon to hear people saying that because it is so intense, um, with, you know, what is expected of you. And it's an amazing experience, but very, um, it's, it's emotionally, physically, and mentally very hard. So, um, just want to, you know, add that in there that even if you, you exclude all the things we've been talking about just here, it is intense in itself. So not surprising. And after you had made this decision that, you know, you kind of done with running, uh, I don't know if I'll do it again. Did, did you ever miss it or did you watch the collegiate championships on the TV or anything and think, oh, I wonder what would have happened if I kept going? Or was that, did you not even give yourself the, did you not allow yourself to think that way? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I I love watching track. Like I've always loved watching it, even when I wasn't competing anymore, Mm -hmm. Uh, just to watch it on television was always great just to see people that I knew and friends that I had competing in the championships. Like that was always amazing to see. Mm -hmm. So I was always really happy for them. I I mean, I definitely had like those what ifs in my mind and Mm -hmm. thinking and like definitely now getting back into running a lot. You know, I think about it like, wow, what if I was running every day back then? Like, Mm -hmm. you know, what could have happened, but like, 
um, I, I definitely, you know, think about that, but I just try to do what I can now to like help the next generation of runners that may be in junior high school or high school and like help them transition better to the collegiate level and like post collegiate and things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. And, uh, I mean, I'm definitely a believer in things happening for a reason. So I, I think, uh, it probably, you know, it, it led you down the path you were on. So, yeah, that's how it was meant to be. Yeah. So you ju- you've just mentioned it. You got back into running uh, in April, if that's right, of this year. Yeah, that that's when my streak started. I kind of okay. got back into running just like at the beginning of this year, like the end of last year, like 2019, like maybe like November, December, I think. Like one of my colleagues, he came to me and was telling me that he started running like at the gym after work, like he would run like 15 or 20 minutes a day. And he was just asking me about some tips for running because he knew I had experience doing it in the past. And he, he was telling me like, this was his first time ever running in his life. Like he had never done it before, Mm -hmm. but I was telling him he should try to do a 5k And he was like, oh, okay, like, that's cool. So he really looked into it. And I told him, like, I'll do the 5K with you. So he had found us a 5K to do in February of 2020. So I got back into running, like, December 2019, January 2020, just doing, like, a mile, like, a couple times a week. I would just go out of my house and, like, run one mile. And I, I kind of was doing that up until the race in February. Mm-hmm. And then we did that race in February. Can I just it, pause you there uh, yeah. uh, before you go on to after the race? Yeah. Uh, for someone listening who, you know, um, maybe it, it's it's hard for people to understand. I always try and explain this, that if you've had those years of running in high school and running in college, that if you take all this time off, someone like you or I is even if you took years and years off, you're going to be able to kind of go out the door and have somewhat of a base level that other people wouldn't have. So what was that like for you running those early days of just running a mile? Uh, Were you able to do it without walking? Were you kind of like, wow, this is really slow. Did you feel okay? How, how was that for you mentally and physically just starting back again? Yeah, I think like the first time I went for a run, like um, I ran like to a park from down from my house. It's made it's like a little bit more than a mile, maybe like a mile and a quarter from my house. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's like the Culver City stairs where you can walk up and you can see like the whole city. So I was like, I want to go over there. So I ran over there. It's like a mile and a quarter. And then I just walked up the stairs to like. Uh, see the view and whatnot, Mm -hmm. and then walk back down. And then I think I ran back home. So I would do like two and a half miles, but just like a mile out and a mile back, but take a long break in between, like a 30 minute break in between. Mm -hmm. But then that started being too long. So then I was like, I just want to do like one quick mile and get it done. Mm -hmm. So then I would go out the house. I would do a mile just like probably around six minutes, like six flat uh, per mile. Oh, wow. So that's pretty quick for someone who hasn't run in a while. Well, not that's what I'm saying. Like I did, I did it out to the park for like three or four or five days before I started doing a mile. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So you weren't running six minutes per mile every day. No, no. When I first started, I was like, I was like, yeah, I would run like a mile out and it would be like 740 or 750. Which or is still fast like to most people yeah. listening. But yes, yeah. it, uh, reminding yeah. people again that Daryl yeah. had all these years of training in his body already that it would have remembered. So continue. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it was like that. But then like running a mile a day just became fun to me and interesting, like trying to beat the time that I ran the day before yesterday. So that just became like a little competition in and of itself for me just to get ready for the race coming up in February. And was your kind of were you during this time seeing other things that you were like, oh, I missed this, like the feel good afterwards or the kind of just being able to get somewhere quicker. Were there some benefits that started to come back to you? 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It just felt fun to me. It was like, wow, I can just run a mile a day and it can be fun. Like I was definitely feeling the runner's high Mm. and like that some days, you know, feeling like, oh, wow, I felt really good today. And then looking at the time and it was like seven seconds slower than what than what it was yesterday. And I was like, how is that even possible? I feel (laughs) so good today, you know, and then other days like not feeling so good. But then the time was faster than it was, you know, a couple of days ago. So that that was like definitely like fueling me and keeping me going, like keeping me out there running every day basically just to get ready because after I had committed to doing the race with them, I was like, man, I don't know if I want to do this race. I didn't even have a pair of running shoes that I owned at that point. So like I had to go out like to the local Ross and just get some running shoes for like $30, you know, just so I could get out and do a couple of runs. Thank you to Tracksmith for sponsoring this episode of the Running Field podcast and for being with me this year. I've been so thankful for their products. I've been purchasing their products myself. I got some extras for my birthday that Steve got me. I've been getting them for my friends and family. I truly love this stuff. And yes, I understand that sometimes I do get given things and that can be tough to hear when we know that uh, people who are representing brands are getting free stuff so they're not having to pay but I have been purchasing things myself because I love them the same with I've heard that Malcolm Gladwell also purchases things for himself and for others the same with Rich Roll these products are quality I know they they are a bit more than maybe what you've paid in the past but they are so worth it Tracksmith is this Boston based brand led by a group of runners who are committed to making classically stylish cutting edge apparel they have this simple goal which is craft the most considered product on the market for runners dedicated dedicated to the personal pursuit of excellence. I can attest to this myself. I have worn their clothes in races now. I have worn their clothes for hours on end now. I have tested it out in every way possible. I've tested the quality. It doesn't seem to change at all as you continue to wash it rather than most running clothes, which tend to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until you wonder what is going on like with my body. But these do not change. They are quality products and they shine in the winter. In the winter months, that is where they really find their own. And I am just loving the Harrier tank, the Brighton base tank, uh, and this session sweatpants I have been wearing all day long while I'm lounging around the house. They are just ideal. I forgot how much I love sweatpants. I haven't been wearing them. I've been so into wearing tights, but I am loving those session pants. And uh, I definitely would recommend getting some of those. I do have lots of my favorite items. If you go to tinamuir.com forward slash tracksmith, or you can go to tracksmith.com and use code TINA15 to get $15 off your purchase of $75 or more. And I just want to highlight one thing quickly, which is that um, they have this off-road collection, which you've probably seen me using, which is celebrating the world of trail running. So now they realize that trail running also is important to us as runners and it doesn't have to mean that you're this hardcore 24 hour runner but you could be someone like me who just heads over there on a weekend or even once every now and again but I love that they've created these products to help get out in nature and explore as this way to engage with the sport but also to detach yourself from what's going on so definitely recommend that off-road collection so again you can use code TINA15 for $15 off your purchase of $75 or more. After I had committed to doing the race with them, I was like, man, I don't know if I want to do this race. I didn't even have a pair of running shoes that I owned at that point. So like I had to go out like to the local Ross and just get some running shoes for like $30, you know, just so I could get out and do a couple of runs. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess you wouldn't still have your shoes from uh, the collegiate days because I've been quite a while at this point. And yeah. tell us, so you did this race with your coworker and then what happened after that? Yep. So after that, um, there was an organization that I volunteer with here in LA called good city mentors, where we like mentor kids in high schools, um, around LA. I worked at like view park school, which is like on the Dorsey high school campus, And, uh, that organization has a partnership with Nike and Nike offered us like free entry into the LA 13.1 half marathon. And that was on April the 5th. So I signed up to do the LA half on April the 5th. 
So I was like, okay, I've been running a mile a day. Now I can just transition into like a half marathon training plan. And then that became like so daunting to me, like the most daunting thing in the world. I was like, there's no way I can run a half marathon. Like all these expectations started coming to me. So I just stopped running uh, again completely. And I did kind of have a good excuse this time because I had got my wisdom teeth pulled out Mm -hmm. like a couple of days after I ran the race in February. So that put me down for like a week. And then I just took that week and extended it out, you know, because I didn't want to train for the marathon. And then, you know, next thing I know, there's like a month until the marathon and I was still taking time off from running. I hadn't started my training plan yet. And at that point, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to forego training in general and just try to finish the marathon was it a marathon or a half marathon? A half marathon, okay. excuse me, a half yeah. marathon. <laughs> yeah, half. just checking there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, sorry, you were saying that you were just, you decided you were going to just finish it and so you didn't really do much running up to that? Yeah, yeah. So, so then like from like the middle of February to the end of February, beginning of March, like I hadn't ran at all, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, the race was scheduled for April 5th, 2020. So it's like March 5th, 2020. And I like still hadn't started my training plan. And then the next week is like the coronavirus shutdown where where everything shuts down. Mm -hmm. So at that point I'm like, Oh, well, good thing. I didn't start my training plan because the race got canceled, you know, and everything Mm -hmm. shut down. But then at that point, I was stuck in the house, you know, all day, not allowed to go anywhere. So then I wanted to go out for runs. Now (laughs) I was like, man, I wish I could go out for a run. So then that's when I just started going out for a daily run, like different lengths, like one mile, two mile, three mile runs. And that's really how I started getting back into running there. So I was like, that was like March the 15th. And then when like March was ending, I was like, you know, I can still do the half marathon virtually. So I I think I got a long run in of like eight miles maybe, or nine miles maybe in between that time. And then on April 5th, I really did the half marathon virtually. Mm. And that was like the first time I had ever done a half marathon. It wasn't like a race for me. I was really just trying to finish it. Like I had no idea if I could finish it, but I thought I definitely could finish it. So I tried it and I completed it. And I think I ran like an hour and 48 minutes, I think Mm -hmm. for the half marathon. And it was just, it felt awesome. You know, I was like, wow, I create, I completed a half marathon Mm -hmm. and that was just like a great, amazing feeling. Like you said, like getting the runners high feeling like, wow, a great accomplishment through running. For sure. And at that point, then again, because that moment was so high for me and I felt so good, I hit another low because it was like no no other running event could then live up to that running event, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So it was like, again, I didn't want to go out the door and go for any more runs after I completed the half marathon. Which is very common for for runners after after a big race or a big goal to just feel those runners blues. And so then what did get you out the door? Um, I had really got a couple messages from people online, like a couple people reached out to me on Instagram, like, you know, why haven't you been running, you know, or why haven't, um, I seen you like post your runs or anything like that. And I was like, man, it's just like, I don't know. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. I was like, I'm just taking time off after the race. But then I was like, wow, people are really seeing, you know, me doing the runs and telling me that it's inspiring them to go out for runs, you know, to get their health in order. Mm -hmm. You know, I try to live by the model health is wealth. And like, I was against running for so long, but like getting back into trying to be healthy, I saw how healthy running actually was for you and how healthy it can be for you. For sure. So just to inspire other people to go out for runs, like that felt good. Like, Mm -hmm. okay, that's cool. 
So then another friend had reached out to me and said he was trying to complete like a 5k a day for 30 days or for 50 days. And I was like, bro, you're crazy. Like, there's no way like I would run a 5k every day for 30 days. I was like, I've always taken days off. Like I have to take days off, you know, like, but then I ended up running like for a week, like just trying to get seven days in a row. And like, I got seven days in a row. And then I really didn't even think about it anymore. Like it just kind of became muscle memory. Like Mm -hmm. I'm just going out for a run, I guess, too, because I had like a known distance that I was running, Mm -hmm. which was like 5K, you know, 3.1 miles. It wasn't like, oh, I have to go out for like a six mile run or an eight mile run or something like that. It's like, no, I can just run three miles and it can be like a good, solid little workout for the day, you Mm -hmm. know? And I think so, that's good to, for hit people to hear because, uh, you know, I had an episode uh, a month or so ago with with James Lawrence, the Iron Cowboy, who did, you know, 50 Ironmans, 50 Days, 50 States. And that's inspiring. And it's, wow, that's really cool. But I would say for the average person listening or for the average person who isn't a runner, that is just superhuman. Whereas hearing what you're saying here, <laughs> it's something that is attainable for, I would argue, most people in the country could, could if they wanted to, and if they were committed to, could do something like this. And that's why I think it's really cool hearing you talk about this because it, it is your, you're like easy to resonate with and, and understand. Whereas something like 50 Ironmans, 50 days, 50 states is just too, too <laughs> crazy to, for most of us to even be able to wrap our brains around. Um, and I'd love for you to, to share, how, how did Miles for Justice then come into the situation from here? Yep. So then I, I kept running and I hit 30 days and I was like, wow, this is amazing. I hit 30 days in a row. So then it was kind of like mentally, I kind of couldn't quit, you know, until I hit 50. So then I hit 50, like right around like June 1st, I think. And this was like days after George Floyd had been murdered and I didn't want to quit running, but I also no longer had the motivation to run. You know, I was just like, okay, I ran a 5k a day for 50 days in a row. Like I'm Mm -hmm. done with it. You know, there's no, nothing more for me to do. So I saw George Floyd be murdered and then you know, knowing about the Ahmaud Arbery murder and then learning about the Breonna Taylor murder, I saw how much injustice was happening in the world. And I kind of knew that my runs were inspiring people. Mm -hmm. So I said, wow, I can try to raise some money through my runs, you know, and see if I can raise some money for the cause, you know, for Black Lives Matter. So I started this campaign. I knew about this platform, Pledge It, where people could pledge a donation for every event that you run for me, like every mile that I ran. It could be for every three pointer that you make or every touchdown that you score. Mm -hmm. And I use that platform to get people to pledge a mile for me, telling people that I would complete like about a hundred miles, you know, in a month, you know, if I run a 5k a day and if you pledge a dollar per mile, that's a hundred dollars, you know, and you know, it was successful, you know, like I had to do a lot of groundwork, like reaching out to a lot of different people on social media and different, um, demonstrations and rallies that were going throughout the community and let Mm -hmm. them know about the campaign. But, we were able to pull 120 people together and raise $5,000 for the Black Lives Matter movement. And Mm -hmm. that was Miles for Justice. And that was Miles for Justice one. And that's kind of how it all came together. Yes. So, I mean, so cool that you can do something like that. And you mentioned about, uh, you know, having never raised money before. So someone listening who has something they want to raise money for, what would you, what would be your advice from what you've learned? 
Yeah, I would definitely say like, number one, you just have to really be passionate about whatever you're raising money for, because there's so many ups and downs, like how I was feeling throughout the day really hinged on whether we were getting donations or not. Mm, Like if we weren't getting donations, I was really down and I was really depressed, you know, like I try not to let that show on social media and the platforms, but I'm really down and depressed. And when we get donations, I feel really high and really upbeat. And that's like, that's not super healthy, but that's why I say like, you have to be passionate about what you're raising money for because mm-hmm. you re- you really have to put everything into it. And then you have to just know that it's not going to be easy. You know, people never want to really just give you money, yeah. you know, for you know, virtually nothing tangible in return, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are things to know, but then you also have to know that it's doable. You know, I, I knew it was doable. I knew I had never done it before, but I knew I could do it, you know? So I didn't know if I would do it. I was taking a chance, you know, so it wasn't a for sure thing, but as it was getting closer and as we were coming together, like, I was just making sure I could do whatever I could do to bring in those donations. So I would say like the resources are out here, you know, if you want to bring in donations, like there's just different resources in so many different places and you just have to get out here and look around Mm -hmm. and you'll be able to find resources, but there no one's like in a rush to give you money for, for just whatever, you know, what your cause is. Well, and there's so many, so many things you could give your money to that. Yeah. It's hard for people to, to decide which things they want to, they want to help support. And if you're passionate and you really believe in something and you have the good enough kind of, I don't want to say pitch, but you can show people how important this is. And yeah, your, your voice is going to scream through the noise basically. And so after you, you'd raised, you more than raised $5,000, you decided that you were going to, um, help with, or do miles for justice too. So tell us about that. Yep. So after raising, you know, the first 5,000, uh, for black lives matter, you know, I think I got to, I was, that was kind of around like 70 days or so in a row running, mm-hmm. I think. And then as I was approaching a hundred, you know, I wanted to see if we could do it again, you know, because anything can kind of happen once by chance, you know, and there was like a lot of need that was still out there. And Brianna Taylor's case, like she still needs justice to this day. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel like personally, I was applying enough pressure for Brianna Taylor, like just trying to do my part to get her justice. So, you know, I decided to just run it back and run miles for justice part two with Brianna to continue the runs again, because mentally, like I didn't want to stop running, you know, I still wanted to run, but still just trying to keep that motivation to run, you know, so it was something else to continue to fuel my runs. And also just for a good cause to bring more awareness to Brianna Taylor and then raise some money for an organization that was on the ground fighting for justice for Brianna Taylor. Yeah. And, and did you have any days or, you know, I- that's, well, firstly, you're still going now with the with the streak and um, continuing. You, oh, I know the answer, but for the listeners, did you raise the money you wanted to for Brianna Taylor's cause as well? Yes, yes, we we raised five thousand dollars, about five thousand two hundred dollars for Brianna Taylor, and coincidentally, again, we had exactly one hundred and twenty pledgers for both miles for justice one and miles for justice two, 120 pleasure. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. And, and what did you find that during both of these, uh, miles for justice campaigns that you did, uh, on days where you, did you, did you still experience days where you felt like, Oh, I don't want to go. And what did you do uh, during this? Did you look at one, a picture of Brianna or what did you do in those moments? 
For sure. There, there were definitely there, there were highs and lows, like days when I did not want to go run, but I just knew like Brianna Taylor will never be able to run again in her mm-hmm. life. Like she could want to go for a run, but there's no way she's ever going to be able, you know, to go for a run again here on earth. So I just go out and run in her honor. And I just tell myself, you don't have to run any type of pace at all. Like you can run as slow as you want to run, just get the time in, just get the miles in because that's what it's about getting the miles in. It's not about hitting a certain time. It's just doing it in her honor. And that's, that's what I would do. Hi friends, today I want to tell you about our black owned business feature of the week, which is Tawa threads and Tawa threads that reflect the natural beauty, contours and silhouettes of the lands we love to wander. Tawa threads styles and bold exploratory colors seek to elevate underrepresented communities by giving proceeds back to organizations who implement inclusive outdoor experiences. I love that. Designs include an assortment of apparel, home decor that are uniquely hand printed, providing each print with its own unique character. Love it. You can feel free to use my discount code, which is run with tower 10 at checkout when you are purchasing your product. That is run with tower 10, R U N W I T H T A W A 10 at checkout when you are purchasing your product. You can find out more by checking out tower threads on their website by going to T A W A T H R E A D S towerthreads.com. You can find out more. You can see their cool design. You can see about the partners they work with. You can learn about the advocates. You can be an advocate and shop by purchasing some of these products. They are just a wonderful company to be supporting a black owned business. I've got to know Tabria a little bit and I love her and I think I'm very excited to, to share Tower Threads with you. So you can use code runwithtower10 at towerthreads.com and go support this black owned business. She could want to go for a run, but there's no way she's ever going to be able, you know, to go for a run again here on earth. So I just go out and run in her honor. And I just tell myself, you don't have to run any type of pace at all. Like you can run as slow as you want to run, just get the time in, just get the miles in because that's what it's about getting the miles in. It's not about hitting a certain time. It's just doing it in her honor. Yeah. And that's, that's what I would do. Yeah. And, and this is considered a a silent protest. Uh, that's why I saw you kind of refer to it as, um, now for, for people listening who, um, have maybe seen all the criticism of the protests and the more kind of aggressive, I guess is the best way to say methods of kind of getting the message out there because, um, Clearly, uh, a lot of the kind of more peaceful and quiet methods haven't been working because here we are in 2020 and things haven't really moved to where they need to be moving. So why why go for this kind of silent protest method? Um, Why was that important for you to do it this way uh, rather than kind of, yeah, going out to a protest and and standing along the, the lines there? Yeah, I think for me, uh, this was just more organic. Like Mm -hmm. it was something really like I was already going on these runs, you know, even before, you know, I had them in this honor, you know, and then for me to be able to add this element into what I'm already doing into my daily life, I think how you were saying, like it can happen across different methods, like anyone can add something like this into some part of their daily life. Mm -hmm. And I'm just showing people like I was already going on these runs, but now I'm going on these runs in the name of justice for Breonna Taylor. So I'm showing people like there's so many different ways we can protest. And for me, it's a silent protest for me just to let people know that this isn't going away. We're yeah. not going in away. Like this is going to be here. You're going to see me every day doing this. Like For you sure. think I'm going to stop doing this, but I'm not going to stop doing this. I'm going to keep doing this every single day just to let you know we have a voice out here and change is happening and will continue to happen as slow as it may come. But we're 
going to continue to be here every single day. And for me, that's just what the silent protest is about. Mm -hmm. Like you can get mad at it, but how can you get mad because I'm bettering myself in the same, you know, by going on a run every single day and it's a silent protest every single day. So if you want to get mad at that and get mad at that, I have gotten mad, but you know, I'm not going away. I'm going to continue to do my runs. Good. Well, myself and I'm sure my, my community will be behind you for, for every day you continue to do this. And uh, I guess this is a good time to mention, I will have links in the show notes to uh, go follow Daryl. Although, as I mentioned at the beginning, your uh, social media is Stretch Murphy. Um, but also uh, hit the links to his Pledge It page. Uh, by the time this comes out, I think you're going to have uh, your next your next thing, which we will talk about in just a minute. But before we get onto that, just related to what we were saying just there, you have been spotlighting and featuring uh, people on your social media page uh, of the past and of the present who have done inspiring things. Uh, Black people who have been grand chess masters to astronauts to the national ambassador for young people's literature, many other uh, kind of career paths and things people have done that might not uh, that others might not have known about and myself included once when I was having a look down your page preparing for this interview, there was a lot of things I learned. Uh, and you started this in 2018. So having been kind of all along, or at least the last few years, been been very vocal about drawing attention and, and kind of showing people what what black voices, what black faces have been doing, um, what does does this whole movement of what's going on right now frustrate you in any way to say that it feels almost like people are checking boxes or do you see it as only a good thing that uh you know the conversation is started even if the method of it is not quite ideal and myself included I'm sure I've said some things during this interview that are not quite right but you know I'm trying and other people are trying how how are you viewing this <sighs> Yeah, for me, um, it's definitely good what's happening right now that more attention and more awareness are being drawn to different issues that have been going on for so long in society. Like, I do agree with you that a lot of different entities may just be checking a box here and there. But, you know, through checking those boxes, hopefully at some point, some person has the chance to step in, Mm -hmm. you know, and let their voice be heard for what is right in the moment and in the time. So, you know, I believe this time is empowering people more and more to do that. So that's why I feel like in the grand scheme of things, it is really good and it is really positive because the more, you know, people feel that they can do that, um, I believe the more the more quickly, you know, we can move toward change and progress, you know, into society Mm -hmm. and to limit racial injustice in society. And for me, like I've always tried to promote and show black excellence um, in society. Mm -hmm. So like when you're looking at my page for the different people that are there, it's just like trying to show people for so long, black people have continued to do so many positive things and so many great things in society that you don't often know about. Like Mm -hmm. many of them, I didn't know about, you know, before I spotlighted them, you know? And for me, it's like, I'm learning, you know, just along with everybody else. And I guess for my whole life, again, like just showing people that you can put like things that you do in your daily life, but just kind of share them with the world and they can help out society. Like Mm -hmm. I've always done, like looked up things and found new information, Yeah. but oftentimes I never will share it with people or anything. So just in the time I have to look up all of these black excellent stories. And then I decided to just share them with the world so other people and know about them as well. No, it's really, it's really good, good idea and good thing to do. And and I encourage the listeners to go back and check out and read through some of Daryl's posts uh, from the, yeah, as far back as 2018 was, I think the first Black History Month that you started to do that. So really cool. Um, So on that note, uh, we've mentioned your uh, Instagram, uh, Stretch Murphy, where else can people find you? Uh, is there anything else you would like to say to my listeners while you have the floor? 
Uh, yeah, pretty much. You can just find me on all social platforms at Stretch Murphy. Like primarily, I really only use Instagram. Like you can find me on the other platforms, but I'm not like super active in mm-hmm. them. Like mm-hmm. I kind of hope to be in the near future, but mm-hmm. like doing social media is like a whole thing in and of itself. So, oh, yeah. So it's like I'm just kind of learning the platforms myself and like how to best use them and whatnot. But I really don't have anything else to plug right now. But I will say Miles for Justice Part Three will be on the way soon. So hopefully by the time this is out, Miles for Justice Three will be here. But I don't have the exact tagline or handle for you. Okay. Um, at this time for what Miles for Justice 3 uh, will be. Okay. Um, well, uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident by the time this comes out, you'll have, you'll have figured it out. And now I'm putting a little extra pressure on you to get it done. So you can you can sit there this <laughs> afternoon and figure that out. Um, okay, uh, Daryl, thank you so much for enlightening us, for sharing your story, for um, just your inspiration and, and giving people a real, a real example of something that can be done no matter how busy you are, you, people could find a way to, to do something similar to what, what you're doing right now. So thank you for all that you do. And and thank you for, for using your voice in a way that is just so important. I appreciate you and I'm sure my listeners feel the same way. All right. Thank you so much, Tina. Really appreciate it. And uh, definitely got to give a big thank you to Joshua and Aaron again for uh, the introduction and the recommendation and that. So thank you to those guys and thank you to you, Tina. Before we end this episode, I just want to take a moment to shout out my podcast editor, Jeremy Nessel, who has done such a wonderful job of looking after my podcast, taking out all the mishaps in the episodes, while still keeping in the the vulnerability and the realness and the rawness of the conversation. This is not one of those podcasts where I take out the ums and the ers and the the sometimes the delay in, in words, because I think it's very important to keep that authenticity. We're surrounded by perfected and manicured everything. And I think it's really important that running for real stays that way. So thank you to Jeremy for your work. I also want to thank Maria Vargas and Amber Moore, who are also part of my team. They've been a big part of this community and me being able to build this brand. So just want to give them a shout out too. All right, let's get right back to the end of this episode. Thank you so much for listening to that episode with Daryl Stretch Murphy. I hope you enjoyed getting to know his story, getting to know him a little bit more and we'll follow him along in the future. We'll check out his social media, go donate to his cause because I just think it's a really cool thing that he's doing and I appreciate his vulnerability and his rawness. So thank you to Aaron and Joshua Potts for recommending him. And if you missed their episode, you can go back and listen to that one because that was also a great one with lots of insight in there. Now I want to take a moment to remind you to thank our sponsors, which are Momentous and Tracksmith, you can get 20% off your order at Momentus by going to livemomentus.com and using code TINA. You'll get 20% off. As I said, I love the collagen peptides. I also love the Elite Sleep. So if you are struggling with sleep right now, be sure to go check out that uh, Elite Sleep product. That is also a great one. And they have a creatine there, which is another thing that's going to help you if you are training for a big goal. So you can use code TINA at livemomentus.com. You can also get $15 off your order of $75 or more by going to tracksmith.com and using code TINA15. As I mentioned earlier, I love the Harrier tank, the Brighton base tank and the Session sweatpants are my favorite thing to wear around the house right now. So be sure to go check those out. Next week, I am excited to bring you an episode with Damien Hall, who is a British ultra runner, and I look forward to hearing what you think about that one. I also have another bonus episode on Monday, so go subscribe if you have not already. You can get links to everything I'm talking about by going to the show notes at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 222. So if you want to find any links or anything we talk about in this episode, you can go to tinamuir.com forward slash episode 222. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.